everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is Dr. Michael Clapper. Michael Clapper, MD, is an experienced clinician who practices preventative and nutrition-based medicine and teaches his patients that health comes from healthy living. Dr. Clapper believes strongly that proper nutrition and a balanced lifestyle are essential for health and, in many cases, make the difference between healing an illness or merely treating the symptoms. A gifted teacher, clinician, and author of successful books and videos on cholesterol-free nutrition, Dr. Clapper has contributed to the making of two PBS television programs, Food for Thought, and the award-winning Diet for a New America. And I have to say, he is probably the most beloved of all the plant-based doctors. So please welcome Dr. Clapper. Well, what a lovely introduction. Thank you so much, AJ. Great to be with you. Well, thanks for being here. You know, we don't usually have people back that soon, but you were just really one of the most popular guests, and it's evidenced by the replays, how many people listen to you, say they love you and they can't get enough of you, so we wanted to have you back before the end of the year. So we got lots of questions, as is expected, anytime we have a doctor, but one of the things I want to say is I love all your DVDs. They sell them at True North, especially I love salt, sugar, and fat, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but in the last couple weeks, I I watched a video that I had never seen of yours called Getting Lean the Easy Way, and I really loved it. And one of the things you talked about was the four S's, and I thought that was so helpful because it's just, we tell the people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program to eat that, but just when you put like acronyms like that together, it's very helpful to remember. So what are these four S's and why are they so important? Great question. And this was a memory device that I devised to help people when they walk into the kitchen, especially the folks who are not as experienced and skilled as you are, uh, all those uh, bachelors out there like I used to be, and folks who who, uh, just don't, when they walk in the kitchen, well, how do you put together a healthy meal? What is a healthy lunch? What is a healthy dinner? And so to help people answer that question in a no doubt about it, surefire way, uh, I said, well, just hang them on the 4S clothesline here. Uh, soups, salads, steamed green and yellows, and starches, healthy mm-hmm. starches. I love and, it. Yeah, and uh, if you and uh, you, you can tell folks how to make up these nice batch soups there, and um, you can make up a, a large soup and coast on it for days in the fridge. Uh, big salads are important, like Dr. Furman says. The salad is the main dish. You want to eat lots and lots of fresh salads, uh, and uh, you know, I just can't. Overestimate, overemphasize the importance of dark green leafy vegetables in, in the human diet. It's, it's trite already to be saying it, but you know this is where cows get their calcium. I mean, think about it. Cows don't drink milk. Yeah. <laughs> where do they get all their calcium? Well, they go to the greens they eat all day, and so should we. So steaming up, I tell people, it doesn't matter what they are, collards, uh, kale, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, char. If you, you like it and it's green, buy it, bring it home, rinse it off, throw it in the vegetable steamer for five, six minutes, uh, and then um, put a non-oily dressing on it, so squeeze some lemon juice over it, some really flavored vinegars, a, a no-oil salad dressing, but don't go to bed at night so you can look back over your eating days. Say, oh, yeah, I had a big helping of, of kale at lunch. Or, oh, I had a big helping of broccoli at dinner. Uh, once a day, you want a big, you know, good cup, cup and a half helping of yeah. something dark and green. And then healthy starches, rice, potatoes, quinoa, uh, preferably in a whole grain form. I'm not a big you know, pasta and bread fan anymore, but uh, yeah. whole grains. And, uh, boy, you, you have a, a table that has um, a hearty vegetable soup, a colorful salad, a big plate of steamed greens, and some yellow vegetables, too, carrots and squash, uh, and, uh, and a healthy starch on it. You've got, a, you've got a healthy, balanced meal there. And so then it's just have fun with the flavorings that you're so skilled at. Right. And it's so and it's so filling. And so it's it's interesting, Dr. Clapper, because what I love about coming to True North is that the way you're telling people to eat, it does facilitate weight loss, but you're you're a tall drink of water and all the doctors are true northers then and you guys eat this way too. Yes, and the, the joy of this, it takes the neurosis out of eating. I mean, eating should be, a, a dieting should be a, a nourishing event on, on every level, not just physically, but, but, you know, it should nourish your mind, your heart, your spirit, your relationships. And, and people, especially if they're trying to lose weight, uh, it's, eating has become an anxiety-filled event. And, you know, how big a portion is this? How many calories of that? How many grams of fat? And I see that and shake my head. It shouldn't be that complex, and it shouldn't be that the anxiety-producing. The beauty of this lovely whole plant food is that it, 
the portion size really don't matter a lot. If you go back for a third helping of salad or a fourth, <laughs> fourth bowl of vegetable soup, who cares? It, it's fiber and water. It doesn't stick to you. And right. uh, so that's the beauty of this food. So uh, you can eat... Uh, uh, you know, quite a reasonable amount. It still wind up lean and healthy. I never think twice about the portions. If I want another bowl of soup, I go back and get one. Don't think right. twice about it. It's, it's so great because so many people feel they have to, you know, weigh and measure their food and count their calories and carbs, and that just clearly doesn't work. So really. It, it, it really is it's such freedom. Has has your pra- has the way you practice medicine changed at all now that you're working at True North, which I know was Dr. Goldhammer's dream for many many years, and he's and we're all thrilled to have you there. But is it different? Do you get a different kind of patient population or were you always just practicing this way oh my what an interesting question well i, I try you know you, well, you succeeded on that one I boy that one gets the wheels turning here the same thing that everybody asks you you know i try ah. to Get to no, know. You're, you're good, AJ. You're good. We know that. Um, so, uh, has my practice changed? Oh, well, of course it has. Uh, for the first 10 years, I was practicing regular blood and guts so medicine, working in emergency rooms and operating rooms, um, until the light went on that nobody's talking to my patients about why they are overweight and diabetic and hypertensive and and uh, through various pathways, it dawned on me, it's the food they're eating. The food <laughs> I was eating, too. I was overweight. I had high blood pressure. I had high cholesterol. And then the plant-based light went on in my head for a number of reasons. And, and for the past 30 years, I've been a doc well over 40, but, but for the last 30 years, my goal has been to keep people out of hospitals and off of operating tables, and it comes down to the food they're eating. And so um, I've had I've practiced general practice uh, most of my career and uh, it's very satisfying but again it, it has to take on a nutritional flavor to it so to speak and the standard general practice that I was in I was doing urgent care medicine in New Zealand and Hawaii uh, it doesn't really lend itself people come in with a cut finger or a broken wrist sure. there, it's not time to talk to them about nutrition and so I, I would have a little ghost general practice on the side but um, the, the government doesn't, the insurance companies don't pay you for talking to patients. They want you to do something to them. So, uh, so there's not much money in nutritional medicine, and that's why I've had to do acute care medicine along with it. So when I finally got uh, the opportunity to come to True North here in Santa Rosa, north of San Francisco, uh, here I could full-time, without any apologies, practice a nutritionally-based medicine. Mm. And uh, it's, not only is it refreshing to have the freedom to do that, but all my other colleagues, everybody's vegan on the staff. Yes. I don't have to yes. shuffle my feet and look askance. You know, we're talking about plant-based nutrition. Everybody knows what you're talking about. And and it's a joy. Uh, I get to spend an hour with each new patient. And and they come in understanding that we're going to be talking about what they're eating. And uh, if you've got patients that are in an open mindset in a setting that is conducive to good nutritional counseling, well, it's a dream come true kind of practice for me. And, and as a result, people get healthy right in front of my eyes. It's the most rewarding practice. People get I, leaner and healthier, get off their yeah. pills. It's a wonderful, rewarding kind of practice. I, I was going to say, it really must be rewarding to see that. Now, I, I, would, I encourage everyone that I know to go to True North, but I know it's not possible for everyone. But they can, you can still give consults over Skype, right? I mean, I've had them. They're fa- fantastic. Oh, I do all the time. I spend half my day on Skype, and it's wonderful to be able to, you know, to reach out to people, but very importantly to see them, uh, to, of course, to see their body configuration, but to see the look in their eyes as they're speaking and to see their gestures, their facial expressions. You get so much more information. So, uh, so Skype is one of the best things that's happened to my medical practice, and, and it's nice to be able to give uh, really valuable advice to people in desperate straits who just, who just don't have the wherewithal to, to travel across the country or for various reasons just can't take the time away. So, yes, I thank heavens for Skype and FaceTime and all those technologies that let us see each other. But good old telephone works as well. I do a lot of phone consoles as well. So if somebody listening doesn't get their question that was submitted answered, how would they get in touch with you or your website to, 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 to have you uh, consult with them? Right. Uh, well, the simplest, most direct way is to call True North Health Center, 707-586-5555. That's 707-586-5555. And uh, when you hear the recording, hit zero and talk to the lady at the front desk and say you'd like to do, have a phone or Skype consultation with Dr. Clapper, and they'll take the information and arrange it. 
And I've done them, and they're really fun. And, and he's right there in his office, so you can see it's really, you know, and he's wearing clothes and everything. <laughs> so, cause I, you know, I know some people that they do Skype, and, like, they tell me, oh, I stay in my pajamas. I'm in my pajamas, oh. right. <laughs> That's no, great. I'm fully dressed. That is great. Well, let's get to a couple of the questions that's submitted. Now, it's, I, I'm going to, like, put one of them in a bundle because, and I'll let you talk as short or as long as you, as you like that. Because last week we interviewed Dr. Ron Weiss, and he kept talking about microbiome. And a lot of these questions are from people that are already vegan. They say they're not only just vegan but whole food vegan, so no oil. There seems to be a lot of GI issues going around, things like IBS and SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and a lot of Crohn's, and, and these people are already vegan, and they say they're whole food vegan. Why we got so much GI stuff showing up now? Ooh, that's a question and a half. Okay. And just, uh, just yes, good. No, that's, a, so that's an ultimately important question. Uh, I don't want to, to minimize it, because I, too, run into that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a couple of things that's happening. When when you take a medical history, it's one thing for the patient to say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not digesting my food well. But to the doctor, that, that doesn't help me. I have to lean forward and say, what exactly do you mean? Are you belching? Are you passing flatus? Are you, uh, do you have abdominal distension? Do you have loose stools? What exactly is happening? And once you start teasing out exactly what's going on, there's a number of different mechanisms at work. And, and many of them are not very exotic at all before you think that you've got some dreadful small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or whatever. Uh, as we say in medicine, common things are common. You know, uh, we're in North America. When you hear hoofbeats, look for horses, not zebras. And so when, so when people tell me they've got these issues, the usual thing, uh, oh, I'm bloated all the time. I, I get full quickly. I pass a lot of gas. I'm burping, bur- um, bur- uh, burping. Uh, this, it's the beans. It's the lentils. Uh, I'm, you know, maybe. But before you blame the poor beans and lentils, they blame for so much. Um, there's usually a more mundane uh, 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 explanation, and that is that they've analyzed the gas in the, in the intestine. It must have been a wonderful experiment to do. Um, a lot of tubes went up a lot of rectums, and they took the gas and put it into a spectrophotometer and found out that 80% of the gas in the intestine is humble old swallowed air. What? Mm, interesting. What? Yeah. You know, and people, well, how can that be? Well, yeah, only 20% is actually made by the action of bacteria fermenting sugars in, in the intestine. 80% of it's swallowed air. How can that be? Well, just the way the throat is engineered, every time you swallow, two tablespoons of air go down into your stomach. So you swallow 20, 30 times in a meal, you're going to have a good half pint or more of air in your stomach. And once it's in your stomach, it's going to go one of two places. It's going to go up, going to go down. You, you, <laughs> you have to really, you had to release it discreetly from above with a discreet uh, erection, the, the medical yeah. word for a belch, yeah. um, or it's going to go down and gurgle and burgle and make yeah. it descend it and, and you pass it as, as wind there. I so, when it goes up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so knowing that, um, people need to understand where that air is coming from. Just swallowing is one thing. Uh, but also there's air in the food and a fork full of rice. There's air between the grains of rice. Then a fork full of salad, there's air between the leaves of lettuce. And a floretta broccoli, there's air down the floretta broccoli. There's air in this food. And if people are eating and talking quickly and they're just shoveling the food in, two chews, well, down it goes. They swallow a lot of air. And, and that's where it's coming from. And so I tell the folks in my digestion videos, I say, you know, it's really important. This is high fiber food. You've got to really take the time to break down the cell walls of the plants so you can actually absorb all the nutrient goodies, the proteins and vitamins, minerals, etc. So I really stress the importance of um, careful, thorough chewing uh, to optimize nutritional absorption. As we say, put the fork down and make salad puree in your mouth before you swallow it. Um, and that's for nutritional uh, uh, efficiency. But the, other, but the added benefit to that is chewing your food to a cream forces the air out of the food, and you're going to swallow a lot less air if you put a fork full of broccoli in your mouth, put the fork down, and make broccoli puree in your mouth before you swallow it. If you do that, you're going to enjoy the meal more, you're going to taste it more, and you're going to swallow a lot less air. Yeah. And so, um, so before you get and bring out the beano and all that stuff, first of all, start chewing your food. <laughs> your mother was right, chew your food, yeah, for, for lots of reasons. Um, 
the 20% of uh, methane and carbon dioxide that is um, made by the action of bacteria fermenting sugars, um, it, on the surface of legumes, um, there is a, and we're talking about beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, uh, there's a sugar called hemicellulose that can ferment into gas. But fortunately, it is soluble in water. And so before you make bean soup or bean chili, uh, soak the beans in water overnight. The next morning, spill off the soaking water, rinse it a couple times, and you'll get rid of most of the hemicellulose that, that can create the gas issues. So those are the two most common um, uh, uh, complaints that I hear about the stension, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other issue is about stool consistency. The doc and my, my stools, and they, they're either liquidy or they fall apart, or yeah. et cetera. Um, mostly that doesn't matter. The truth of it is yeah, that just has to do with the, with the physical properties of the food you're eating. If you're, uh, you, in order to make a stool mass stick together, you need both soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. What does that mean? The soluble fiber is, is fiber that absorbs water. That's uh, you know, rice, oatmeal. You know, if you put, uh, put some oatmeal in a cup and add water, it, it plumps up and absorbs water. That's soluble fiber. Then there's the insoluble fiber, like a celery. You know, put a celery stalk in a, in a glass of water, it's not going to absorb the water. So uh, you need both. You need both the soluble fiber uh, and the ins insoluble. So therefore, in about a, roughly a 50-50 mix, you don't have to be too compulsive. So you want to eat your rice and your oatmeal, but you also want to have your salads and your kale. And uh, if you do that and, um, and chew them up really, really well, uh, the stool mass should be, you know, easy to pass, soft, and um, and and hold together. But again, if you eat just a whole bunch of, of lettuce and and salad and steamed greens and some fruit, that stool mass is going to fall apart. There's nothing going to hold it together, and that's fine. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. There's no don't uh, judge your your life, the course of the success <laughs> of your life by your stool consistency. There, it's just <laughs> this too shall pass. It's, it's, it, it doesn't matter. So we don't have to have the Bristol stool scale memorized. No, you don't have to have the Bristol stool scale. It, it has its role, but... I think uh, you're so right, Dr. Clapper, that I think because so many people come from eating a diet so high in animal products and processed food, which have no fiber, and they're so... You could practically swallow things like chicken nuggets and Cinnabon. They've kind of right. lost their ability to chew, coupled with the fact that many people eat mindlessly, watching TV, texting. Yeah, they're, they're not really focusing on chewing. What an important point. Uh, we become a nation of shovelers. We just shovel the food in. <laughs> we're, we're driving a car and we're shoveling yep. it. We're watching TV and we're shoveling it in. We're talking on the phone. We're shoveling it. We're making love. We're shoveling the food <laughs> in there. Um, That's yeah, like Seinfeld. Yeah, Seinfeld. Really. <laughs> yeah, George. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, exaggerating, but only a little, you know, and re eating has be become a recreational event. We've, we've gotten into recreational eating here and yeah. just mindless shoveling, as you say, and it's not good for so many reasons, um, uh, as you well know. And, you know, we don't appreciate the food, we don't taste it, we eat way too much of it, and we swallow too much air doing it. So yeah. slow down and be with every uh, every mouthful. I, I'm, one of my beloved medical patients, uh, Baba Ramdas, wrote a book, Be Here Now. Right. And uh, so we turned that around. We said, we, we eat here now. You know, just oh. be an eater. You know, just oh, that's, that's all you're doing. Just eat right now. Be a fully present eater. Right. And you'll enjoy it more and, um, and have a lot less gas along the way, too. You made me think of an idea for a T-shirt. They have all these keep calm and do this and that T-shirt. should be keep calm and chew your food to a cream because I'm always quoting <laughs> you with people. I also quote, your, my favorite Dr. Clapper quote is that your body is never not looking. That is brilliant. It's so true. But I love that quote of yours. That's wonderful. Exactly. So I have an, this is an interesting question I don't know the answer to. Uh, Carolyn writes, uh, I was wondering how a vegan diet affects vision. Can it improve your vision and can it do anything to help cataracts? or macular degeneration. Oh, important. Okay, so uh, with so many conditions, and on some level, all of them, well, we're talking about blood flow to important tissues. And certainly when you're talking about your eye and the retina of your eye that has such a vast network of blood vessels, you want every one of those little arterioles and capillaries open. And there's this bad, nasty macular degeneration where people get older and they uh, and their vision starts to dim. They they get blind spots in their central visual field, and the and they go to the doctor. Oh, you have macular degeneration. You know, we're gonna have to inject into your eyeball some liquids, and maybe it'll help. Maybe it won't. Doctor, what causes? We don't know. Well, 
again, uh, medicine just refuses to uh, take into account the overwhelming effect of what our patients are eating. That macula should not be degenerating. It doesn't happen. It's not part of old age. It's a part of what that person's been eating all these years. The standard American diet will clog up your arteries, and the tiny arterioles and the capillaries plug up fastest because they're the thinnest, and, and those retinal cells are dying from lack of blood flow because the arteries are clogged up. It's a sign of artery disease, like so many other conditions. And will um, a whole food plant-based diet um, reverse that? Well, it depends how much tissue damage has been done, how many retinal cells have really been lost. But you can't count the body out. You know, the, your job is to eat a healthy whole food plant-based diet So, because tiny sealed up arteries can open up. They do all the time, as Dr. Esselstyn has shown us. So in, this includes the vessels in your eyes. And um, so could a plant-based diet uh, increase blood flow to the retina? Sure. Could that help you regain some vision and macular degeneration? Quite possibly. Could it keep the macular degeneration get from getting worse? Absolutely. And so that's definitely something to, uh, to keep in mind and, and use for motivation. Now, cataracts are something else. That's the clear little lens in your eye that, uh, uh, that allows light to pass through. And that, um, uh, that becomes damaged from a uh, combination of too much sugars and oxidizing agents in our diet. Uh, then uh, compounded by blasts of ultraviolet light from uh, bright sunshine with no uh, sunglasses, etc. And the, the clear uh, protein in the, in the lens of the eye starts becoming cloudy and, uh, and opaque and doesn't let light through. Once that happens, um, you, you know, you can't unscramble an omelet, you know. <laughs> uh, once the, len the lens is that damaged, um, you, you probably should, and if it's affecting your vision, your reading, your driving, you, you should get that fixed. Fortunately, it's one of the best operations that, that modern medicine has come up with. Uh, I had it done myself in my right eye. And uh, you lay down on the table where you, can, you have real trouble seeing. 20 minutes later, um, uh, with a painless procedure, you can read license plates across the street. It's, it's a miracle uh, procedure. So if anyone has cataracts and they've been afraid of that procedure, uh, don't be. Definitely get it fixed. You'll be glad you did. It, it really changes your life for the better. But then still protect those retinas, protect uh -huh. the rest of the eye. Still comes down to a healthy whole food plant-based diet. Uh -huh. And you really want to emphasize those green and yellow vegetables for all their antioxidants uh, to, help, um, to help protect those very delicate cells. Right. Yeah. I, and I just find because you've been you've been vegan, I don't know, a long time, right? 1981. 1981. So I'm, 30, I'm bad at math. Almost 40 years. Yeah, and, almost. And, and myself as well. And, you know, and one, I, one of the things I love about you, Dr. Clapper, is even though you are a doctor and promote this healthy lifestyle, you care about the animals as well, as do many people to become vegan, but they, they're not eating any vegetables. They're not putting the, the VEG in vegan. They're eating just a junk food diet, you know? Oh, AJ, you are just so valuable in getting this message out. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Because I get lots of you, as you're implying here, a lot of passionate vegans, especially young folks, but they're living on energy drinks and granola bars. Right. And you just can't run a healthy human body doing that. And eventually it catches up with them and their energy levels go down and their teeth start getting rotten and they lose muscle mass. And people say, oh, that vegan diet's terrible. Exactly. I don't care what it is. And, and it really defeats the very purpose that they're, they're making this effort to, for. So thank you for saying that. It, it, everyone out there is trying to help the animals. The most important animal right now to help is the, yourselves, your right. own human body. Take care of that animal. Nourish it to the best uh, you possibly can. And then uh, every, all the other animals will benefit. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I, I know the answer to this one, but I'm sure they want to hear from the doctor. Anita writes, I was wondering if you could ask Dr. Clapper whether transferring to a plant-based diet has any effect on osteoarthritis. Now, again, uh, we're talking about the types of joint degeneration uh, where the bone and the cartilage have really been damaged. This is different than inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. lupus arthritis, yeah. where the tissues were inflamed, but the structures are still intact. The, uh, the cartilage and the bones are intact. Here, osteoarthritis, there's been actual structural damage done. Uh, and, um, and if you've got really knobby fingers or a really ground down hip joint, uh, no, it's, it's not realistic to think that just eating vegetables is going to reverse that. Um, but uh, again, it'll help 
stop the uh, condition from getting worse. It will uh, help the, the inflammation that is inevitably present. It will help the painful aspect of it subside. And, um, and if you do have to have the hip replaced or the, the fingers operated on, uh, you're going to recover much better. And you'll, uh, you'll, you'll wind up really appreciating your good health because you'll have clean arteries that you can use that hip to walk with. So, um, no, it's not going to reverse severe structural damage, but it will keep it from getting worse, and it will really help take the pain away yeah. if, 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 if that's still possible, given the an, an structural anatomy of the joint. Right, right. Excellent. Thank you. Sharon writes that she has carotid stenosis. Could Dr. Clapper give his opinion for treating this condition? She has been on a fairly consistent plant-based diet for almost a year and a half, but has very high cholesterol, 313. It does not get lower. She refuses to take statins. What are her alternatives? When people say fairly consistent, though, I wonder what that means. You know? uh, it's a, you're a pro. You, you and I both had our ears twitch when we heard that word. Yeah. When, when, I, when I have the patient in my office and I hear, well, I eat pretty good, Doc. Yeah. But I'm, I'm almost vegan, Doc. I've, I've been trying really hard, Doc. I'm almost there. Uh, you know, the jaws of nutritional hell yawn open at that point because you because a lot of things can happen between pretty good and really doing it. And and, and this is not to, uh, to to make fun of, of the person who's asking the question, but but in general, it, it does illustrate the point that, as I said, your body's not, not never not looking. It's, the body's not impressed with with excuses. It's not impressed. With, with almost, with uh, I'm out at a restaurant with friends, your arteries don't care, your eyes don't care, your carotid artery doesn't care. Um, Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. Dr. Claver says, I own health be true, I own arteries be true. And so if you've got, this is serious business, you've got plaque in your carotid arteries. These are the ones that go, that take blood up to your brain, and they're the ones in your neck. And, uh, man, you don't want plaques building up there for obvious reasons. It, it kind of sets you up for strokes, etc. cetera. And, uh, and you've got plaques in your artery with a cholesterol of 3+, three, three 300+. Plus. Uh, this is no time for almost or pretty good or, or kind of. So, um, so those, you know, the, what I mentioned earlier, those four S's, soup, salad, steamed green starches, man, that would be the – the backbone of the food going down this person's uh, throat on a daily basis, tons of of fresh salads, lots of green and yellow vegetables, and be absolutely scrupulous. Um, You know, obviously no hidden animal products, but uh, but the vegetable oils, the refined sugars, the, the, the junk food, uh, even though it's vegan, it, it hurts your arteries. Uh-huh. Let's let me get a little further into this. People are so fixated on these cholesterol numbers. Oh, my cholesterol is two forty. It's three ten. Whatever. I don't particularly care what people's cholesterol numbers are. They're a marker for their lifestyle in general. But the point is, these plaques do not develop because your cholesterol gets X so high and the stuff starts sticking to the walls. The, these cholesterol plaques are the end product of a cascade of injuries to that artery wall. That, that wall has been injured and inflamed. Uh, the, the cholesterol, whether the person's been eating it or making it themselves, gets oxidized from sugars in the diet, soft drinks, air pollution, cigarette smoke, stress hormones, hydrogenated oils, junk foods. All these things oxidize cholesterol. They rip electrons off the cholesterol molecule. And it's this oxidized cholesterol that starts burrowing into the wall of the artery, setting off a big inflammatory reaction. The plaque develops on top of that inflammatory reaction. You know, the plaque is the tail of the dog. Uh, of, of the of this process and so it's it's not just a matter of how high is your cholesterol the question is how healthy are your arteries mm-hmm. and uh, and yep. if that plaque's building up then this person and no person's on the, this individual but just by example then this person been doing something that has been injuring those arteries and uh and again you got to look at the sugars and the cigarette smoke and whatever it might be the, all the, the processed food the restaurant meals all that stuff so if you want to melt this plaque away, which is the, which is the take-home here, and uh, I urge that, is that she get uh, Dr. Esselstyn's excellent book, Preventing and Reversing Heart Disease, and follow it to the letter. She's got plaque in her arteries and a high cholesterol. She's got no wiggle room. She yeah. needs to follow. She's got to be an Esselstyn devotee to the nines. Yeah. And if she does that, that plaque will start melting away, and she won't need a stent and a surgery and all that kind of stuff, and sure doesn't need statins. Those are my most unfavored drugs. Sure. So, um, so declare Be Kind to Artery Week. 
every meal that you eat should just flood your bloodstream with all those wonderful phytonutrients and the green and yellow vegetables and the cells. You bathe those carotid arteries with those kind of, of nutrients, meal after meal, day after day, month after month. Those plaques will melt away and your cholesterol will come down and you'll be okay. But this is a wake-up call, a warning bell for you with those numbers in that plaque um, to, to really clean up the, the dietary act all the way around, be a great nutritional vegan. Right. Or, you know, she could even go see Dr. Esselstyn. He has a program or come to True North and see you. I mean, those things would be very helpful. I think. Absolutely. We get people with clogged arteries all the time and we, yep. uh, we get them on a really clean diet and, the, and those arteries start opening up. It's a wonderful thing to see. Yeah. Greens are like Roto-Rooter, you know, they really Absolutely. are. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. They really are. You know, as I listen to you, Dr. Clapper, I'm thinking, God, I could listen to you every week. I wish you had a radio show or did this every week because you have such abundant knowledge and you know so much about so much and you answer these questions so eloquently. I think we should think about having a weekly show with you, you know, because I, it, I think people would love it personally because, I mean, we're not going to get to all the questions, but the good news huh. is is you can still talk to Dr. Clapper by calling True North at 707-586-5555 and scheduling a phone consult or Skype. Do you have a website, Dr. Clapper? If people I want do. To Thank up? you, AJ. Thank sure. you. Absolutely. And we're in the process of uh, putting up some really good features. Uh, my website is drclapper.com, but it's all spelled out, small letters, no spaces, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A. P E R dot com, one P and Clapper. Um, and I'm in right in the middle of putting on a um, uh, putting up a presentation called Thriving on a Plant Based Diet. So everybody who wants to nourish themselves on a vegan diet can do so without winding up skinny and scrawny and uh, malnourished like people who are afraid of doing. Uh, mm -hmm. this is gonna be on how to do it right. We're uh, I'm working on it, I'm re recording it now. I should have it up there by the end of the month. Excellent. And uh, it'll, it'll be very valuable. But we got lots of questions and answers and webinars and videos to watch. Uh, so absolutely, I invite people to come to my website, drclapper.com. And when can we expect a book? That's the one thing we haven't gotten from right. you. Right. Oh, you, boy, you, you know me well, AJ. <laughs> uh, thank you for lighting that fire. Um, I'm starting, actually, to write a book. Uh, for, oh. with my, with my, if I ever catch the guy who only put 24 hours in a day, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind here because I'm about three hours short every day, and I, I could use that at the sure. end of my office day to, to write my book. There's no excuse. You've written a couple of good ones. Yes. Um, do, you so I am, do you have a title? Because if you don't, I want to suggest one. Okay. Uh, I'm open to, see, to suggestions. What would you say I should title Your it? body is never not looking. Oh, that's a good because, one. Because it's true and you say that all the time. That's brilliant. Yes. Yeah. I, Thank you. Oh, that's a great yeah, angle. Thank yeah, you, AJ. If that's, if, it's, if that's not the main title, that can be... It be the subtitle. Right. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank right. you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so, because that's when I think of you, that's what I think of. Yeah, so, no, that's... you're right. Okay, so we have a question about, are probiotics good to take for lessening candida? I've never heard of that. Oh, for sure. Um, probiotics are the beneficial bacteria that live down in our gut, our microbiome that we are all getting more familiar with. And uh, the, the products uh, also have not only the bacteria, but they have uh, nutrients to help the bacteria get a, get a foothold or a tentacle hold or whatever they hold on to with uh, to establish a, a population of healthy bacteria down in the gut. And there's, if you have if you truly have candida, and you know a lot of people who get told they have candida, they, they think they do. You know, you, you want to send off a stool culture and see if you know if it comes back two or three plus candida, then absolutely do something about it. Um, or you may suspect it if you've taken a long course of antibiotics uh, and eaten a bunch of sugars. Those are good, um, and drink alcohol. Those things will kill off your good bacteria and and promote the growth of uh, of candida. So. If you think you have it, you know, test for it. And if you do, uh, there are natural substances uh, that you can get at the health food store to help knock down the candida uh, population, uh, caprylic acid, etc. There's also, uh, your doctor can prescribe nice statin, which stays in the, in the intestine, doesn't get absorbed in the bloodstream, or, or more potent ones. But getting around to your question, after you've you know, knocked, you know, you stopped abusing your intestinal flora, you know, stop the alcohol, stop the antibiotics, stop drinking chlorinated waters, uh, uh, stop drinking soft drinks, all these things that kill off your good bacteria. Stop eating sugar as a food. It's a mm -hmm. flavoring. Don't eat it as a, as, a, as a Snickers bar. You know, so as long as you stop those things um, and whether or not you deal with the candida with some agent, 
your next move is to to reestablish a healthy population of good guy bacteria down there, not only because it will help your gut heal, but by their very presence, they keep the candida from coming back. Uh, they, they devour the food that the candida uh, would use for its own nourishment. So a long answer to that question. Absolutely, probiotics play a key role in, uh, they can just, by, just by their um, numbers, can crowd out ca uh, candida overgrowth. But, but once you get rid of the candida overgrowth, the probiotics will keep the candida from coming back. So absolutely plays an important role. Best time to take probiotics is either an hour before meals or an hour before bed, there's the least, uh -huh. a, the least acid in the stomach at that time. Uh -huh. So you, you, these are live bacteria. You want to sneak through your vat of hydrochloric acid down your stomach. So you want to pick the time when there's the least acid in your stomach. So that would be about an hour before you eat or just before you go to bed. There's usually very little acid in the stomach at that time. And so um, take, take a you know, fairly good dose. They should have at least 5 to 10 billion um, organisms in every dose. And if you take it, as I mentioned, uh, before meals, before bed, uh, you'll get the best effect out of it. And True North sells an excellent brand. It's free of dairy. That's the one I use. So they also sell some really other good things. If you guys are interested, the website of True North is www.healthpromoting.com. You know, you mentioned about the stomach acid. One of the things I learned from you that I was so appreciative of is because I, I had eaten raw for a while and it didn't do as well for me as eating, you know, uh, partly cooked food. But a lot of the raw food is say that, you know, you can't cook your food because, you know, you'll kill the digestive enzymes. And you said, you've got the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, it's going to do, the, you know, it's going to, it's not going to matter. You know, you, you brought that point out, which I thought was really great, that it doesn't matter, you know, if, whether it's raw or cooked, because the hydrochloric acid is still going to do its job on everything you eat. Yes, um, most of the anxiety generated over the raw food cooked food is, is really scientifically uh, misplaced. In that, yes, there are enzymes in the tips of the uh, uh, of the sprouts and at the tips of the lettuce leaves, etc. But these are plant uh, growing enzymes. These are leaf. Uh, elongating enzymes. These are root tip elongating enzymes. These are chlorophyll synthesizing enzymes. They're not human digestive enzymes, first of all. Second, um, yes, they, you know, you'll destroy the enzyme. Yes, I have every intention to destroy those enzymes. I'm going to chew them up and swallow them down into my vat of hydrochloric acid where I will take those enzymes apart to their individual amino acids, send them up to my liver, and reassemble them as my enzymes. So I certainly uh, have every intention of destroying those enzymes. So this whole idea is a bit misplaced. But that said, there is a kernel of truth in what they're saying. The more you add heat to food, the deader it gets. And um, so, I'm, so I say if you want to add heat to food, the gentlest way to do it is some method where water is involved. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, steaming kale, uh, making a soup, just adding hot water to soften rice. These are minimally destructive uh, mm -hmm. ways of adding heat to food. And if you do that, you, know, you may lose a little bit of uh, vitamin C, the, some of the water-soluble vitamins, but, um, but that's why you should be eating lots of fresh salads and raw vegetables and raw fruits. I'm not saying don't eat those. You eat a lot of those. And, the, and you're not really, when you're steaming the kale, because you're going to eat a lot more steamed kale than you will raw kale, you're yeah. not really eating it for the enzymes and for the vitamins. You're eating it for the magnesium, uh, mm -hmm. For the calcium, these are not destroyed by heat. You're eating it for the fiber and the lignans; these aren't destroyed by heat. Sure. You're eating it for the amino acids and the and the and the minerals, the fat soluble vitamins; these are not destroyed by hot water. So, uh, so that whole idea that just steaming and veggies makes them uh, worthless to eat uh, that puts an unnecessary fear in people. And as I said, those enzymes are going to be destroyed. But um, but that said. Stay with the water-based cooking methods because once you put you know, bread dough in an oven at 400 degrees, you are causing damage. Once you mm -hmm. broil things, once you fry things, absolutely, I agree that you have really damaged that food and you don't want to be eating uh, things that have been fried in oil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as long as you just have it's a water-based uh, method to add a minimal amount of heat, uh, don't worry about the enzymes. Eat a lot of fresh salads to make up for it, but, but chew the foods and enjoy it. You'll, uh, you'll as you say, a partially cooked meal, uh, diet is, is much more balanced. Right. And thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So Michelle has a question based on a long-running argument with a friend. And she asks, can a healthy person with no heart disease, 
no high blood pressure, and normal cholesterol levels, who has been eating a whole food plant-based diet, which includes 10 to 15% of healthy fats, such as raw nuts, seeds, and avocado, develop atherosclerosis. My friend maintains that the latest research shows that inflammation is a primary reason for developing atherosclerosis. I maintain that such inflammation is often caused by diet or by medical conditions such as diabetes, which are linked to diet, and therefore, it would be virtually impossible for the healthy person eating a healthy whole food plant-based diet to develop plaque in their arteries. Please comment. Well, in a way, they're almost saying the same thing, but the general gist of what she's saying is right. This is, you know, we used to say back in the 50s and 60s when people dropped dead of heart attacks, well, that's just what happens when you get old. No, it's not. The artery clogging and atherosclerotic plaque formation, this is not a normal part of aging. This is a disease from inf chronic inflammation of the artery walls. And uh, you know, combined with a uh, high fat, high cholesterol diet and you know, other aggravating factors. And so the gist of what she's saying, if, you, if day after day the only thing running through those arteries are the phytonutrients from whole plant foods prepared gently uh, without, un without all the processed junk and oils and all that stuff. Um, and the other obvious things that the person um, isn't smoking cigarettes, they take a walk every day, uh, and they're reasonably happy, so there isn't a lot of stress hormones and cortisol and adrenaline in their bloodstream. Now, there's no reason that plaque should form. Uh, they should have a low cholesterol level. Uh, and there's no reason those arteries should get inflamed any more than they should suddenly develop a brain tumor or asthma. There's no reason these things spontaneously develop. And the same thing with, uh, with artery inflammation. So I will side with that person saying, no, a healthy vegan eating, living a healthy diet, a uh, healthy lifestyle, eating whole plant foods should not um, and virtually could not develop arterial plaques. Uh, if, if they do, there's something else, uh, some other unbalancing force that's injuring those arteries. And yes, probably what they're eating. We agree. Great, great. Yeah. It's the food. It's the food. <laughs> I've got a plaque in my wall here. It's, a, it's the food. It's yeah. been the food all along. Yeah. That, could be another, food. That, that could be another title for your book. It's Indeed. the food. Indeed. Yeah, it's the that, food. We've had two good ones so far. Yeah. What about these doctors on the other team that are saying, oh, but, you, you know, you could have a cholesterol that's too low and that causes mental illness and, and, and all these things. I, I don't want to say the name, but it's somebody that's written a best-selling book that doesn't agree with us because I told him my cholesterol was 99. He said, oh, well, you're going to get dementia or mental illness. I mean, can you really have a cholesterol that's too low? I can't see that uh, because – Nature gave us this wonderful organ called the liver that knows exactly how to synthesize cholesterol, and it's constantly monitoring the cholesterol in your blood. And if you need more cholesterol to synthesize your estrogens or cortisol or whatever, your liver will make more of it. To think that suddenly your liver is going to lapse so badly that it won't make enough cholesterol to, to keep your brain nourished, it defies imagination why that would certainly happen. Now, now, you've got to give the liver what it needs to, to get on with its uh, cholesterol synthesis. So you've got to eat healthy fats. You need some avocados and walnuts and, and flax seeds and olives. You know, fats are not evil, right. but you want them in whole forms, not yeah. out of a bottle. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as you do that, yeah, relax. Trust your liver. It doesn't make sense. that uh, It's like your, your pancreas isn't going to make enough insulin. Your you know, that's silly. Of course it will, unless you've damaged it. It knows how much to make, and your liver knows how much cholesterol to make. It, to, to think that nature needs us to go out and, uh, yeah, like that says, we're obligate carnivores, and we're not. So we synthesize no. all our own cholesterol. So, no, I strongly disagree with that. It doesn't make logical sense that that could happen in the body. Right. I love when, you know, when a, lot of, in a few of the talks you mentioned about when people absolutely have to eat meat, you say not even a mountain lion eats meat every day or let alone three times a day. I love that. I, love, I remember everything you say. You have, <laughs> you have some lots of pearls of wisdom there. So right. that's great. So uh, this next question is about something that actually I've heard isn't even real. I don't know, but this is just things I've heard. It's about adrenal and thyroid exhaustion. And it says, my thyroid and adrenals are in the high normal range, but I have all the symptoms for both. Will adequate rest, adequate rest, low stress, and eating a whole food plant-based diet bring me more and more energy and help my thyroid and adrenals to heal completely? Lovely. Uh, <clears throat> because she answers her own question. And all I just have to say is yes. I mean, 
um, it's hard to, or it used to be hard at least, to quote exhaust your adrenals. And and uh, people say, you know, and I just cringe when I hear those words. My adrenals are shot. You know, there's some iridologists will look at me. Oh, your adrenals are shot. And that's such a horrible, destructive. Uh, image to put into someone's head, especially your own, um, uh, that, that phrase should be uh, banned uh, from health practice. Um, now, the adrenal glands didn't used to be in danger of exhaustion. The only time you used them, when, when, when if a saber-toothed tiger walked into your cage, cave, uh, you, you, know, you had a burst of adrenaline, but it didn't happen that, that often. But we do uh, live in a state of chronic stress, and month after month, year after year of generating a lot of stress hormones, it can take a, a toll on the organs. Um, they do have a lot of reserve, and, uh, and she answered her own question. If she does exactly what she said, good food running through that adrenal glands, carrying lots of, uh, lots of nutrients it needs to make its hormones, um, same thing with the thyroid gland, but very importantly, she said rest. That's really important. We heal when we sleep. We heal when we rest. The, uh, it's such a, a, a chronic deficiency. I'm talking to myself here, too. We're all sleep deprived. <laughs> we, we don't get enough true relaxation. We always have our, our eyes into some electronic screen. We're always in the car running someplace. It, it's a, it's a, a level of stress that isn't good for us. And if we, she were to do what she really said, to, to really um, have a wonderful diet filled with phytonutrients, to really get you know, your six, eight hours sleep at night, more like seven or eight, your, um, and, and to reduce the stress levels and to be less compulsive and controlling. You know, when things happen, yeah, you know, if you can fix it, fix it. If you can't, it's a lesson. Just let it, let it go down the river there. Now, I'm, my serenity is worth more than, than anxiety over little problems. And if she actually can do those things, uh, yes, the thyroids heal, adrenal glands heal. There are supplements and things that, that are supposed to be able to help them. But by and large, just give your, your tissues what they need in the way of good uh, phytonutrients from a plant-based diet and, and quit running them on full blast all the time, and they'll heal uh, very well. So, yes, there are lots of hope, even though you've been stressing your adrenals. Mm -hmm. Great. Denise wants to know how to talk to people that believe the hype about all these things, like when you see Time Magazine run a story about putting butter in your coffee and that all of a sudden butter is good and the paleo diet, which is counter to everything you teach and I teach and we believe, because you, you as a doctor could debate these people, but us lay people, how do we talk to people about this? Mm. Oh my, the media has just done so much damage and put so much confusion into people's minds. It's one of the real tragedies, one of the real retarding forces that's holding us back. Because like our dear friend, Dr. John McDougall says, people love to hear good news yeah. about bad habits, boy. And, uh, and Time Magazine just laid out a banquet of, of good news about bad habits. And it totally overlooking you know, years of solid science um, you eat a bunch of fat. It, it kills off good bacteria in your gut. It allows endotoxin in your, in your food to leak out into your bloodstream, raises cholesterol levels, sets off inflammation. It is not healthy to do that. And, and, but people just blow past that because butter tastes good on the tongue. And, and one study showed it didn't raise cholesterol or something. And, and that's what they jump on and, and they trumpet that. And it's a grave disservice, uh, pun intended, I guess, uh, for, to everyone. So, so what do you do? Um, well, one, become knowledgeable. Um, and, and again, I, I can't praise highly enough our, our dear, beloved Dr. Michael Greger. Go yeah. to, uh, go if you don't, listeners, if you don't know about nutritionfacts.org, please go to nutritionfacts.org, all one word, um, and and go to Dr. Greger. He, he does these lovely two-minute videos, three-minute videos. And go to his, uh, uh, his sections on saturated fat. Click on them. Watch his videos. You'll get all the ammunition you need. So you can, because once you know the facts, you can just, it's like someone saying that, uh, you know, the, the sky is, is orange. Well, it's really not. And, and, and knowing from that, that stance of certainty, you can tell people why the sky is not orange. You can tell them, studies have clearly shown that their saturated fat 
you know, raises cholesterol levels, it increases artery inflammation, it increases obesity, uh, it, it increases uh, injury to the gut, uh, it uh, kills off good gut bacteria, and and say you know that 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 whole idea has really been a, a grave disservice, you know, not to fall for it, and and that's all you can do, you know, you can you can lead a horse to tofu, but you, yeah. can't, you can't make him eat it. <laughs> And, and people, if they're, if they're really sold, they, they want to be able to feel good about eating their whatever. You know, everybody pays their nickel and takes their choices. But, but the paleo diet is, is a diet of death. And that's a dramatic statement, but it's true. It, not, it certainly kills the animals that are eaten, but it kills the people eating them. It kills the planet. And these people are setting themselves up for a epidemic of colon cancer and strokes and heart attacks and autoimmune diseases. This is not normal. As you said, not even mountain lions eat flesh three times a day, but that's what the, this diet is per, telling us to do. If someone asked me, doctor, how, I want to cause a colon cancer. How do you do that? Well, it's simple. Pack your colon full of meat three times a day. <laughs> Let that rub on your colon wall for 20 years. Watch what you set off in there. These folks, uh, they know not what they do. The, this is no primate eats flesh three times a day. Gorillas, pin, chimpanzees, uh, baboons, no, no primate eats flesh three times a day. They sure don't eat, feed their young flesh three times a day like we do. It's gotten way out of hand. And, uh, and I'm, I fear there's going to be a, a grave price to pay uh, on, the, on everybody's uh, level, the people, the, the animals, and the planet. So don't fall for the paleo line, folks. It's not a healthy diet, to say the least. Oh, boy. Well, you've mentioned Dr. Michael Greger, the other great vegan doctor named Michael, and he and you both are going to be speaking January 16th, 2000, excuse me, January 17th, 2016 at Healthy Taste of LA. So if you'd like to see both great vegan Michael doctors, you can get your tickets at www.healthytasteonline. And if you buy early, you get all kinds of great bonuses. And that happens to be Martin Luther King Jr.'s weekend. So it's a holiday weekend. So you don't have to get up early the next day to go to work, most of you. So we hope you can come see Dr. Clapper in person if you can't get to True North and see him. So Dr. Clapper, last question, or maybe not depending how quickly you answer it, <laughs> is you've inspired so many people, but who inspired you? Oh, my. Uh, well, at the risk of being trite here, um, I look uh, funny at True North, uh, one of our guests here, uh, This is, we have people come and stay here to fast, etc. Um, Howard Lyman was here, uh, he, I, I just saw him yeah. this afternoon, and, and Howard and I looked at each other, we've we both been in the trenches for so many years, we, we met each other 25 years ago, and he's one of the old war horses like me, uh, and, and those of my generation, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, uh, Dr. McDougall, uh, man, they've all been out front. They, they blazed the way uh, for, for all of us. Um, but I get inspiration uh, without um, uh, being uh, obsequious here uh, from, you know, they're the major sectors uh, of, that, of this movement. Um, uh, are the, the folks working the animal front, God bless them. But the real foot soldiers and the real masters on the chessboard are the chefs, are the cooks, because you can talk cholesterol and inflammation until you, the cows come home. Mm -hmm. What matters is putting the food in their mouth. And so if they say, once you put that tofu lasagna or something in their mouth and they say, oh, if that's vegan food, oh, I could eat that. Oh, that's not bad. You change their lives. It, 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 a taste is worth 10,000 words. And so it's you guys who are making the food accessible um, uh, in the books and the videos and the taste, uh, the taste of LA, the, to get people to actually taste the food and make it a reality for them. That's what's going to change. So, so I get inspiration from you, and I get inspiration you and your your colleagues, and inspiration from the kids, from the younger folks. There's a whole generation of really enthusiastic advocates for the planet, for the animals, for for veganism in general. Uh, the, the internet is filled with people who take one ask vegan nutritional films. Let's get that out. There's so many wonderful people doing such wonderful work on so many fronts that I was in the depths of despair a few years ago. But I, I am much more optimistic now, thanks to uh, to all my allies um, in this uh, in this wonderful campaign, this mission that we're on here. 
and uh, and these folks making the food and putting it into people's mouths uh, are are foremost among my uh, my inspiring heroes. So okay. I'll acknowledge you and thank you for that. And thank you. And why did all the best doctors like you and Dr. McDougall and Dr. Goldhammer, and Dr. Sultana and Dr. Lindsay, why why why'd you all end up in Santa Rosa? Can you spread it around a little and come to LA? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't seem fair that that's like the only place we can go practically. Really, and you know that's not a, that's a real issue, of course. And I've been talking to Dr. Goldhammer about opening up other centers around, and and there's a lot more plant-based doctors now. There's a plant-based cardiologist, the head of the American College of Cardiology yeah. is, is a vegan, and yeah. uh, and Dr. Osfeld, the cardiologist at Montefiore in, in New York, right. um, and and in in LA, there's uh, they're vegan docs. They're whether they want to do a whole center is one thing, but um, but there, there's going to be more and more vegan doctors uh, working on an outpatient basis, uh, and there's uh, probably going to be centers opened up, and so. Stay tuned. It's, a, it's an exciting time, and uh, you may well have a, uh, a vegan nutritional center near you in the near future. That would be so cool. You know what else would be cool, Dr. Clapper? Because both my brothers became physicians, and I know them like you. They're both from – we were from Chicago as well. They're one of them – they're roughly your age. They got almost no nutritional training in medical school. Wouldn't it be cool if, like, there was actually a plant-based medical school where we got them right at the beginning where we could teach them what oh. you know? Instead of having them to learn at the not that you learned at the yeah. heart, but you know what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely, and it's starting to happen. Um, I'm told that the, the you know you can't tell first year med students that the cause of clogged arteries unknown. Etiology, we don't know what causes it. You know they oh. laugh you out of the room at this point. And I hear that they're demanding courses in plant based nutrition because that's what they're going to be treating the rest of their careers. So I'm optimistic, and I'm going to be uh, writing Dr. Barnard uh, this week to. Uh, to talk about going on a speaking tour to medical schools to uh, to to convey that very message to the young med students because you're right that's absolutely where the uh, education has to take place so that's another exciting frontier. That would be so cool and who better to deliver it with than you? It's just it hasn't this gone by very quickly, Doctor. Sure Clapper? has. Wow. Talk to you every week seriously. So it's been such a pleasure talking to my guest, Doctor Michael Clapper. If you would like to have a consultation with him in person, either phone or Skype, you can call True North Health at 707-586-5555 and then press zero and speak to the receptionist. You can go to his website to find out more about him and watch some really cool stuff and get some great information. And that is www.drclapper. Doctor is spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R. Clapper has one P, with with a K, K L A. P-E-R. And if you want to see him in person next March, he's going to be speaking again on the Holistic Holiday at Sea Cruise. The website there is a tasteofhealth.org. I'll be speaking as well as will is Dr. Campbell and Dr. Greger. Or why not come to L.A. next January 17th, 2016 and see him speak at Healthy Taste of L.A. You can get your tickets now at www healthytasteonline.com. Dr. Clapper, as always, it's just been a, such an enlightening experience talking to you and such a pleasure. And I hope you will be a frequent guest on Healthy Living. And thank you so much for what you do to make the world a kinder and gentler and healthier place. Oh, thank you, AJ. It's just been an absolute delight. Thank you for your listeners. Thank you for your great energy. And you bet, anytime you want to talk, I'll be glad to talk with you. I think it's a wonderful service to provide for your listeners, and I'm honored to do so. So oh, thanks again. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you this December at the True North Holiday Extravaganza, right. which I believe there are a few more spots. If anybody would like to come to that, go to www.healthpromoting.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Clapper, and thanks all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>